Good morning, Kamloops. It's uh, great to be back in Kamloops. And uh, the reason I say it's great to be back in Kamloops, this is where I learned to tie my first knot, deliver my first baby, do my first surgical assist. Uh, about 40 years ago, in the early 70s, uh, UBC thought it would be good to get their fourth year medical students out into the uh, rural BC. Uh, Kamloops was considered somewhat rural at that time, and uh, in the thought that they might interest uh, medical students to become family doctors. So for me, it, uh, it did work, and so I went to Mission, which is about 80 kilometers uh, east of Vancouver on the Fraser River. Uh, Going there was kind of like doing rural medicine. We were basically a, a GP hospital with no consultants, but it was, uh, we, we just took everything. Uh, we ended up developing a critical care unit, and uh, it was just a lot of fun to practice medicine. But you know, I look fondly back at my days in Kamloops 40 years ago with the uh, fam <coughs> family doctors up here. It was a great community to practice in, and uh, they were wonderful teachers and just a lot of enthusiasm. So when I come back here today, it's uh, it's a real deja vu if, in some ways. So um, in practicing uh, family medicine there, uh, a couple of things happened in the uh, 80s to me. One is that you're like super busy, young family practice, and uh, we had a, a very fertile community. Um, ended up doing quite a bit of obstetrics. In one evening, uh, waiting uh, for a prolonged first stage of labor, you know those magazines that show up in your uh, doctor's offices and you know or in doctor's lounges like diagnosis and, and that sort of thing? They had an overview on ADHD and I'm reading this article as I'm waiting for this baby to deliver and I'm thinking of these kids that I'm seeing in my practice and uh, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I recognize that kid and that kid and that kid, but astoundingly I thought, you know what, I missed this lecture in medical school. I, in fact, I didn't go to the CME courses that were talking about this, so I, so I tore the article out of the uh, magazine, took it to the office, and we had a, a Xerox machine at that time. You probably remember Xerox machines, and so I printed off about 10 of these articles and started to pass them out to some of these families. And lo and behold, often, and sometimes even in the same day, mothers would come back in and say, this is my kid, do something. And I'm thinking, do something? I think, okay, it says Ritalin, and I've never prescribed Ritalin before. I went into the CPS and thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and s started to uh, write some prescri prescriptions for Ritalin, thinking, you know, well, this is what my colleagues are doing. And uh, fortunately, I ended up getting some good results uh, uh, at the beginning. And uh, the first child I treated was uh, a grade one student who was expelled from grade one. Um, and back in the uh, late 80s, that was quite something, because they usually kept kids in school. But what was even more astounding, the father was a teacher in the school. So you can imagine what they did to keep this kid in school and accommodate the child. The child did a 180. It was absolutely dramatic. And I'm thinking, it looks like I know something about the disorder. And so I was asked to uh, do some talks about ADHD and uh, uh, makes you read some more and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what I did. And, uh, and one of the things I did find in this whole process was uh, that these kids did grow up, okay? They got older and they were still having problems. And I was also dealing with their families. And you know, their, their parents are pr having difficulties as well. So as a, a process of having this initial interest in kids, and then uh, uh, working with their families, I ended up starting to see adults more and more. So what I would like to share with you this morning is basically an approach as to how to handle um, ADHD with adults in your office in a primary care setting that uh, hopefully will be user-friendly, comprehensive, and hopefully keep you out of trouble in trying to uh, not prescribe in an illogical way. So uh, mission um, is growing. Uh, I should just also state with the introduction, that was for uh, the plenary that I gave at the family practice meeting in uh, October. I'm no longer head of family practice in mission. I resigned uh, at the end of uh, 2012, and, uh, uh, which is great. Um, so uh, more time to do other things. And one of the things that I do do now in mission, and it was talked about, I work on a child needs mental health care team where I do sessions um, with uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, mental health clinicians, where we look at some of these really complicated families and we go into their homes, <coughs> we do school-based conferences, a great way to get out of the fee-for-service model and actually be able to spend time with patients. And I think 
what's going to happen with this new initiative that we're seeing in the province right, right now with child and youth mental health, it, there may be an opportunity for more f family physicians to follow this path. And if you have a chance and an interest, I would certainly encourage you to pursue that. It really is a very satisfying way to uh, break up your week and uh, spend time with patients. So does everybody know who this is? Is there anybody here who does not know who this is? This is William Tell. This event occurred on November the 18th, 1307 in Switzerland. I just assumed everybody knew about William Tell until my daughter told me, who is 32, that she didn't even know who this guy was. And um, I realized that my daughter did not grow up reading comic books. And um, so what happened on November 18th in 1307, um, William Tell and his son were walking through a, a village in Switzerland that was under the control of the Austrians. And a rather arrogant uh, Herr Gessler uh, had his hat pinned up in the town square. And uh, the villagers were required to bow to the hat. <coughs> William Tell said, I'm not going to do that. So the uh, governor got really upset and said, well, I'll execute you both unless you can shoot the apple off your son's head. His son's name is uh, Walter. And to me, this typifies a good day in practice for me. When I can walk into my office and I can see a strep throat, bang, okay, penicillin, urinary tract infection, macrobid, you know, anyone sees up, a little bit more metformin, that's good, you know, bang, 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 bang. Diagnosing ADHD in childhood is kind of like this as well, okay? Are all of you comfortable diagnosing <coughs> ADHD in childhood? Is anybody not comfortable diagnosing ADHD in childhood? Okay, um, it's a challenge but uh, it gets a whole lot more complicated than adults, okay? But uh, so to me, what is not a good day in the office is when this walks in, okay? And this really <laughs> represents trying to diagnose ADHD in, in adults, okay? Because, yeah, okay, I guess I should be at the microphone here. And with adults, uh, you know, <laughs> the apple is just smaller, okay? There is so much else, so many other things going on. And I look at Warren here, uh, as being the multi-axial diagnosis that you see uh, with ADHD. And just to go through this, uh, ADHD is an axis one diagnosis, okay? Uh, but 80% of adults who present are comorbid with many other things going on. And what you have to do is to try and sort through that comorbidity and then when you finally take that shot that you'd really like to hit the apple with your strategies for at managing ADHD. So when we look at the axis one uh, diagnostic uh, challenge that we have, not only do we have ADHD, but uh, 25 to 30 percent of these individuals will be uh, uh, suffering uh, with a mood and anxiety disorder. A substance use disorder is also right up there as well. Ch kids who are not treated with AD, uh, for ADHD in childhood, there's about a 40 percent chance by the time they hit age 15 that they will have a problem with uh, uh, addiction with an abuse to uh, uh, substances or alcohol treated, that number drops down to 8%. And compared to their peer group, their adolescent peer group at age 15, that number's around 14%. So when you start to look at what can happen in the Axis I arena, it's, uh, it's huge. 20% of adults with ADHD will be struggling with an Axis II diagnosis as well. Big problem can uh, really uh, complicate issues of compliance and really trying to figure out what the agenda is. Axis three, another big problem, because uh, individuals with ADHD are risk takers, okay? Things happen to them. They tend to smoke early, they drink, and there is sequelae to drinking and smoking and risk taking. Uh, uh, and so you, you look at the multi-system involvement that you might find with somebody with ADHD. Axis four, the psychosocial noise associated with this disorder is huge. The impact on relationships, employment, uh, uh, acad academics is, is massive and uh, we'll talk more about this as it goes on and then we talk about what happens in uh, the Axis 5 uh, area. I mean, many of these individuals because of their comorbidity and everything else are not functioning are optimally. Many of them cannot work but most of them are employed but are, are usually underachievers and do not get along well often with their co-workers and it can be just really really challenging. So when you think of the disorder, uh, think of Warren. And when you take those 
the arrows out of your quiver, there are basically three shots you need to make in, uh, uh, when you're trying to make this diagnosis. One, you have to look at developmental history, okay? You have to establish the existence of, the di of, the, of this disorder in early childhood, okay? Preferably before the age of eight or nine, before they get into grade four. Ideally, we would like to make this diagnosis in kindergarten grade one and initiate treatment because the results of treatment are, are very good. The other arrow that you look at there, that is cross-sectional history. And that is, what is their level of function at the present time? What are their levels of impairment? And uh, the third arrow is looking at family history. Arrows do not, I'm sorry, apples do not fall far from trees. ADHD is the, one of the most inherited things that we see. It's the second most inherited thing we see next to height, more so than gender. About 80% of kids who have the disorder inherit the disorder from their parents. And when a child presents with ADHD, there's about a 25% chance that one of their parents actually is an adult with the disorder. So when it comes to issues of parenting uh, and dealing with some of these families, the, quote, the, unquote, the psychosocial noise can be really quite significant. So um, I, as you can see, I'm a very visual learner here. So think of William Tell. Think of three arrows. And, uh, but before I get into making the diagnosis and getting into some of the treatment issues, has anybody heard of this document? Your attention, please. Put out by the uh, Council on Healthcare and Economic Policy by the BCMA. This came out about uh, uh, three years ago. And uh, this w was huge, this document. And I think uh, the BCMA did a huge service t uh, <coughs> for uh, uh, child and youth mental health with this document. Because what it's done is it's that it's really, I think, been what's behind a lot of the initiatives, with particularly with this PSP module that we're seeing. I know that it had a huge impact with the BC Task Force for ADHD. And the numbers here are quite shocking, which I'm going to show you. But I would encourage you to uh, Google this or to con get on the BCMA website and read this document. It is uh, very readable, but very enlightening. And what they did is they looked at the um, cost of ADHD in the province of BC for fiscal 2008 and found that it probably exceeded uh, $500 million, which was half the PharmaCare budget, but also equaled the total capital expenditures in healthcare for that year. Massive amount of money. And this is based on a prevalence rate for ADHD of four to, four to 17 year olds um, at a, uh, six to eight percent, which accounted for over 60,000 uh, individuals in the province. Um, and in terms of trying to make sense out of the sense spent, uh, we look at this progression of the disorder into childhood, and that clearly 65% uh, of children will uh, be struggling with this disorder into adulthood. But when you start to look at the numbers even more, this is uh, quite shocking. Um, healthcare costs five times more expensive uh, for those with uh, ADHD. Uh, education costs are massive, 18 times. You look at the issues of, uh, our, uh, that occur in our justice system, uh, that's huge. And when you look at it, the comparative costs in the US, I think these comparative costs will uh, be similar to what we see in our own backyard. Um, ADHD ranks up there with issues of um, the mood disorders and, uh, you know, close to stroke, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought uh, this was, uh, you know, these are big numbers. And I think as primary care physicians, if we can diagnose and treat early, I think we can have a huge impact on the uh, burden of costs uh, in our healthcare system. So uh, I think it's important that we do feel comfortable in making the diagnosis uh, in. Uh, early childhood, but anywhere along the uh, life spectrum. Um, and what's important is, is when we do that, I think we can have a huge impact on this complicated metamorphosis that we see uh, emerging in uh, youth and adults. Um, talked earlier about uh, family history. It's a big issue. Cross-sectional history, there's some assessment scales that you'll have as handouts here. Um, and I'll talk more about those later and uh, always be thinking about the, uh, the comorbidity that you see with the disorder. Um, and because that is absolutely key. Comorbidity, uh, I think it's important to really appreciate we, because um, when you think of uh, ADHD, uh, in, probably in kids, uh, only 20 to 30% of them will be actually have just ADHD alone. Uh, 
if comorbidity is not controlled uh, effectively, it can make the symptoms of ADHD a whole lot worse. It's kind of like when you have a pneumonia and a fever, okay? The ADHD is the fever and the comorbidity is the pneumonia. So sometimes you may be trapped into making decisions therapeutically uh, where you're thinking you're simply treating ADHD, where in fact you should be addressing the issues of the comorbidity being possibly the mood and anxiety disorder, but we'll talk about that more later. Um, what I like to do is to look at the core symptoms of ADHD that we see that are pretty generic through the lifespan, and, uh, but it is modified from childhood into adolescence into adulthood. And the first thing that we look at is the inattentiveness associated with the disorder. disorder. There are two types of inattentiveness, the micro and macro. The macro is what we all see. Individuals with the disorder don't have a problem starting on something. They all get started. They have a problem completing. They distract very quickly. And when they do distract to do something else, they have a problem with what's called impaired working memory. In other words, they have a problem with calling what they were previously doing. So that can be very challenging for anyone uh, throughout the lifespan, uh, and particularly in the workplace because mistakes are, make, are made all the time as a result of that. The micro-inattentiveness is very difficult for these kids. This is the Swiss cheese attentional span. In other words, they're fading in and fading out. So they'll be listening to you for a, for a couple of seconds, and for another couple of seconds, they'll be thinking about something else, and then coming in and out, in and out. Very difficult for them to follow um, instructions, lesson plans, that sort of thing. Very difficult to read. Uh, you talk to some of the adults with the disorder and kids, reading is extremely difficult. They have to read something three or four times to finally get it. They're working really hard. And when you combine that with the issues of macro inattentiveness, homework is, is a, a real challenge. Uh, the impulsivity factor, this uh, individuals with the disorder, they react to situations, they don't respond. They generally know what to do, they just don't know when to do it. Be careful when you assess uh, somebody with a disorder, when you see somebody who doesn't really know what to do, nor do they, do they know when to do it, then you're really dealing with some of the other issues, particularly in childhood, when you have to look at the issues of uh, the spectrum disorders, autism uh, spectrum disorder, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Those kids um, uh, are impaired uh, as far as their intellectual abilities are concerned, but generally uh, in, uh, individuals with a disorder, if you put them into a scenario-based situation and say, look, if this happened and this happened and this happened, you would get the right answer. They know what to do, but to take them from the scenario into the situation, they react to what's going on and things happen and uh, uh, can be a real problem for them. Uh, we all know about the hyperactivity part of the disorder. Um, that changes as kids get older. They become somewhat more fidgety, hard for them to sit still, uh, but you don't see them more moving around as much as uh, uh, particularly as uh, teenagers and, um, and as uh, adults. Uh, we talk about impaired working memory. I talked uh, that's about uh, getting distracted and not recalling what you're once doing. And you combine all that together then you end up with uh, uh, impaired executive function. The ability to track and cognitively, sequentially follow problems it can be really uh, difficult for a number of these individuals. I should mention that about 40% of these individuals will, have a, 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 will struggle with a learning disability, a big problem uh, for, uh, for child and youth in, with this situation. And a learning disability is really an impairment in um, secretarial function. Uh, the uh, first three years in school are spent learning to read. After that, you read to learn. And when you have a problem with learning to read, which we call secretarial function, if you like, um, and you combine that with the issues of executive function and ADHD, these children are really challenged. They tend to uh, start saying, I can't, rather than I can't about things a whole lot more quickly. And in the school, system uh, really do need a lot of help. So it's important to uh, recognize that group early. And when we start to look at these core symptoms, we start to see uh, the issues of, um, as I mentioned early, hyperacti earlier, hyperactivity. These kids are easily distracted. They do make a lot of errors. They tend to be very intrusive, uh, blurting out answers. Uh, they have a problem waiting their turn. Uh, they, in the classroom, they do find it very hard to sit still. Um, or if they have to sit still, they want to make something else move. And they start to, get, uh, to, start to have major problems with self-esteem. This is where it all starts, about saying, I can't, rather than I can. Um, with these uh, children, um, 
uh, if interventions are early, then we can hopefully modify a lot of this very, very quickly. Two thirds of children will, uh, about 75% of kids will have um, what we call ADHD combined type. Probably another 15 uh, to 20% will have the uh, primary inattentive type where they're simply just inattentive and uh, a smaller number will, ha will have the hyperactive impulsive type. I've yet to really see a child who's hyperactive impulsive and not inattentive. So uh, but the majority of what you see in your office is the uh, combined type, but the primary inattentive child will be the daydreamer, kind of like um, uh, the slug that you like in some ways, that they just uh, are, uh, are very slow and um, just seem to be in their own little world. So in order to really understand what happens in adults, you really have to track the disorder through adolescence and what you see more of the disorganization, the reactivity rather than the responsive type behaviors. The risky behaviors start occurring, issues with uh, sexuality, substance abuse. I spoke earlier about the challenges of untreated ADHD into adolescence, that 40% number at age 15 of having an issue of substance and alcohol abuse is, is absolutely enormous. Um, and they start to uh, have problems with authority figures. One third of them will not complete school and another th one third will start experiencing school failure by the time they uh, get into high school. Uh, and most of the dropping out occurs early on, uh, circa grade 10. So assuming that they make it uh, through high school and they do get older, they become adults and adults are very challenged. Um, as you can see, uh, they're great procrastinators. They forget to do things. Uh, <laughs> they're poor listeners usually. Um, they don't complete uh, what they often set out to do. Uh, they often have big issues with anger. Uh, Self-esteem is very negative and uh, this is all reflected in the workplace as well as marriages. The divorce rate is often over 50% uh, in adults. So getting back into some of the negative life events that we do see, I talked about grade failure. It's up at 30%, uh, failure to graduate, another 30%. Teen pregnancy is massive. That represents the risk taking that we see. A red light for the diagnosis of ADHD, is, and that is uh, when you see somebody who's adopted, ask the question, could there be an issue of ADHD uh, uh, as part of the presentation. STDs, um, higher in this cohort as well. Uh, substance and alcohol abuse, uh, you can see that number there. Motor vehicle accidents, it reflects the risky behavior that we see, but also um, the inattentive factor is quite significant. Uh, the driving studies with ADHD young adults are absolutely scary. Um, in fact, the examiners doing the studies will refuse to, act, to drive with some of these uh, young adults because they, what the, they do is they monitor the amount of time that the eyes are off the road uh, while they're driving and they become concerned when it's more than three seconds. And uh, the problem with individuals with the disorder, I mentioned that they tend to react to situations rather than respond. So when you have something occur dramatically in driving, rather than just overcorrect, like they really overcorrect. And uh, so the, ac the accidents tend to be more catastrophic. And untreated adolescents uh, with driving, there's about a one in three chance that they're gonna crash the car. Um, if they do not have ADHD, that's about one in eight. Overall, I think uh, with adolescents, it's about a one in five chance that there will be some sort of fender bender or major accident. But if you're an untreated ADHD adult, it is really um, uh, a challenge uh, to stay out of an accident. Uh, the, uh, and you can see when they talk about the at fault car accidents as well, the incarceration number is absolutely huge. Uh, and that reflects really the multi-axial diagnosis, not only the ADHD issue, but I did mention earlier that up to 18 to 20 percent of these individuals with the disorder will end up with an access to diagnosis, be it somewhat antisocial, that sort of thing. Uh, combined with their issues of substance use, it's really a recipe to, uh, to be incarcerated. Um, we talked about issues in the workplace, that number is very huge. 52% uh, end up getting uh, terminated for whatever reason and we talked earlier about the issues of uh, addiction and uh, the access one and access two conundrum uh, that you are presented with in your office. So um, 
in children, uh, uh, comorbidity is uh, is the rule rather than the exception. And uh, I, just to take a look at those numbers there, um, and I think if we can intervene early, we can have a huge impact on issues of oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, and always in the back of your mind for the child that is falling behind academically, always think of the learning uh, disability factor and ask for uh, uh, a psychoeducational assessment because the school will get money for uh, uh, help for these kids and uh, uh, and that's an important thing to know early on in life so they can also be uh, helped throughout their whole academic career and also in the workplace because they do learn differently and they have to be examined differently and this is very important for young adults wanting to do post-secondary education. So comorbidity um, are those conditions that are defined as uh, uh, issues that uh, individuals have to deal with that are a result of the disorder, this complicated metamorphosis, or sometimes these individuals, individuals are just simply hardwired for issues of mood and anxiety. So the question being, does early screening, diagnosis, and treatment prevent the evolving comorbidity or metamorphosis of the disorder? And the answer is definitely yes. And so what I've given you uh, in your handout are a number of rating scales, and these are the ones um, I use in the office right now. And uh, the one that I find very helpful is the Barclay Self-Reporting Adult ADHD Rating Scale. And it's very quick to fill out in the waiting room, um, and that will definitely tell you if you're in the uh, in the zone to consider uh, adult ADHD. In Part A, it's uh, if they uh, rank at four out of six, uh, you should really be considering, yes, this could be a problem. Um, the, the, a more extensive adult assessment is the CADRA uh, rating scale at cadra.ca, and that's uh, worth going on to as a resource. Um, I did not print out any of those rating scales from CADRA. It, the, the paper is just massive, uh, but is a great resource online. The, uh, the Ratty Hallowell Adult ADHD Rating Scale comes from the book Driven to Distraction. I don't know if any of you have read that book. It came out in the early 90s. And Drs. Ratty and Hallowell are two adult psychiatrists in the States who uh, admit to having adult ADHD and can relate to all the challenges associated with it. And out of Driven to Distraction came uh, a 20-question rating scale, which I still use in the office. I've been using it for about... Uh, 15 years now, and anything over 15 out of 20 is positive for the disorder. Doctors Ratty and Hallowell feel that once you're 12 out of 20, that's really positive for the disorder. But what it is, it's just a one-pager that individuals can read and relate to what problems they might be having. And again, this can be filled out in your waiting room. Well, uh, uh, have them come a little bit early if you know that's what they're, they're coming in for. But often, adults coming in with the disorder will say, you know, uh, after they've got their sore ankle, Doc, I think I've got adult ADHD. What can you do for me? It's kind of like Warren. And, uh, and it's at the end of your 10-minute appointment. So what do you do? And so one of the things you can do is provide them with these rating scales and have them come back and book a longer appointment. And with that longer appointment, take those three arrows out of your quiver and look for developmental history. If you can get uh, old report cards, but uh, it's very hard to get old report cards. If you can get a parent to come in to provide some uh, background information, that's very helpful in establishing the diagnosis. It is key to have that element of the diagnosis of ADHD in, in childhood. Um, the second arrow is that arrow of um, what's going on with the at the present time, and that's where your current adult rating scales will give you uh, some uh, help in trying to make the diagnosis. And uh, bringing the, the parent in is really good because we talked about apples not falling far from trees, so you actually get to see the tree. And, uh, and that can be very, very helpful as well. And, uh, and I think when you can bring all that together, then you can start to, I think, uh, develop uh, a reasonable diagnosis of, ad of adult ADHD. And uh, the other thing I also do in practice, if there's any history of uh, 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 mental, he mental health issues, mood disorders, 
Everybody gets a PHQ-9 and GAD-7. They are so easy to fill out and they are so telling. Many of these patients do present with a comorbid ongoing depression. Some may be treated for the depression already, but they're not treated to remission. And that has a huge impact on the ADHD presentation. So, uh, and, and also these rating scales do not uh, create a lot of paper for your chart, but they are very informative. But getting back to, you know, I think making this diagnosis is a question of just being a good doctor and taking a good history and getting the narrative. The narrative is absolutely essential in uh, trying to make this diagnosis with, with uh, adults. Asking them what elementary school was like, what high school was like, and they can, uh, you don't have to ask them a lot of questions because they, because they will come out and they will tell you how much they've struggled and you just sort of get this feeling that, yeah, you know, with the rating scales and the narrative, the diagnosis is there. So let's say you've made the diagnosis, you know, now you've got to hit the apple, right? And I think with what you've uh, got in hand with that narrative and those rating scales, I think you can hit the apple fairly confidently. And so in terms of treatment, comorbidity always trumps ADHD, okay? In other words, if you're going to treat this disorder and there's an ongoing depression in a, uh, or an anxiety disorder, you must get that under control. As a rule of thumb, I don't treat a, an ongoing substance use disorder uh, and ADHD at the same time. Um, I just think in primary care, that's not a, a real smart thing to do. What I usually do is try and get them into an addiction program, and once they've been clean for about six months or so, then we can talk about treating the ADHD. Uh, it will be argued that they're self-medicating uh, to treat their ADHD with drugs and alcohol, but uh, I think that you must uh, uh, get the uh, abuse disorder uh, in control. So let's assume that you've treated the comorbidity and you've got a handle on that. What can you do from a non-pharmacological uh, perspective? Well, all these individuals need structure, okay? They have to habituate good behaviors. It takes 21 behaviors to make a habit, right? So they must get into the routine of setting up their day so they don't forget to do things. And that things then become habitual, like with particularly with kids. But even adults need to really master the day timer and remember to look at the day timer. Um, things have to be fun and, uh, and, and particularly with kids, you have to get them to engage with the school, um, their, their peer group, uh, in the workplace. Uh, often adults with a disorder will say, you know, this individual really keeps me fired up. They know what, I, I have my problems and they, you know, just, they're in my face and on my case. That helps a lot in a very positive sort of way. And when you have those uh, <laughs> therapeutic relationships in place, it really makes a big difference for adults with a disorder. So in terms of treatment, 80% um, of individuals with a disorder will respond to stimulant medication, okay? And uh, we have two types of stimulants, uh, the methylphenidate class and the amphetamine class. Um, me methylphenidate is uh, Ritalin, Bifentin, Concerta. Uh, the amphetamines are, uh, you know, Dexarine, uh, Adderall, and Vyvanse. And then we have the non-stimulants uh, being uh, Stratera or Atomoxetine. We rarely use Clonidine and the tricyclics, tricyclics and bupropion now. Um, clonidine was used significantly for the hyperactive impulsive kids back in the 90s, but I think there are just better strategies for that right now. Just as a, I mentioned earlier that 80% uh, will respond to stimulus, but the, uh, the stimulant response is very interesting. About a third will respond to only methylphenidate, and a third will only respond to the amphetamine class, and two-thirds will, will respond to both uh, classes of medication. The response uh, the, the effect size for stimulant treatment, and I should know how you calculate effect size, but I don't. Uh, but the effect size for anti antidepressants is about 0.5, which I would like to use as a comparative. Uh, for uh, uh, by, uh, methylphenidate um, and the regular uh, Adderall and Dexedrine, the effect size drops, uh, jumps up to around 0.88 or 0.9. 
but with Vyvanse, the effect size uh, increases to around 1.2. These drugs are very effective once you get the di diagnosis made and, uh, uh, and treatment in place. What is interesting about Vyvanse, and you, many of you may have heard of Vyvanse, is that it is a pro-drug. It's not an active drug. Um, it, once it's absorbed into the system, the red blood cell produces a, an enzyme that claves the lysine molecule off the, uh, uh, the Vyvanse and makes it an active drug. It's described as being smoother in terms of onset of action and drop-off drop of action. The problem with the uh, shorter acting medications and also the Ritalin SR is that they're formulated to, um, uh, they, once it stops working, it just stops working and rebounding is a big problem. The, why issues of Concerta uh, and Bifentin are more preferable uh, to, as a, uh, to start off with treatment is because that they last longer and there's not the issue of rebounding that you see with uh, the, the shorter acting medications or what's covered with Pharmacare. The, the first question I always ask in prescribing a stimulant, do you know what that is? third-party coverage, yeah. Uh, do you have a plan? What is interesting, I've given you the cadre recommendations uh, for ADHD uh, throughout the lifespan, throughout childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, and they reflect consensus best practices across the country, okay? The second-line treatments that you see there are the first-line treatments in British Columbia, okay? And will, are also the first-line treatment, uh, treatments uh, recommended by the new practice support program and that's based on just coverage alone. Uh, you can get coverage for these new newer medications providing you jump through the hoops of uh, trying uh, children and I've also had coverage for adults uh, for Concerta um, where you have to write letters but you have to uh, really present a case where they've not responded to the uh, traditional uh, treatments of dexedrine and Ritalin uh, for issues of side effects, rebounding, that sort of thing. And if you can do that, Pharmacare is fairly uh, reasonable in approving um, uh, Vyvanse, uh, Concerta, and, uh, uh, and Adderall. In fact, I had my first Vyvanse and Adderall let, uh, request for special authority approved uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, th they are now recognizing that what CADRA has recognized recommended as first-line treatments are uh, a standard of care and do reflect best practices and they were very obstructionist about a year, uh, a year or two ago with these meds but they're becoming less so now. Uh, so I think there, there is a, uh, uh, I think you can reasonably prescribe these meds once you've made that diagnosis and I think by using the toolkits presented to you I think that uh, it's worth a trial. And the other thing about the stimulants, they work immediately, okay? Uh, you get what you see basically day one or day two, even side effects, of course. Atomoxetine, um, I think, is a, a good uh, alternative as well, particularly for the non-responders, those with any, uh, significant anxiety disorders, tick disorders, and an active seizure disorder. So uh, uh, Stratera uh, is, a, is an option to, to consider. Uh, the, the dose has to be titrated. Um, from uh, 0.5 to 0.7 to 1.2 milligrams at two weekly intervals. It takes about two to three months to really maximize effect. And, uh, and I personally don't feel that it's a, a first-line drug for the treatment of the disorder. I think everybody should be afforded a trial of stimulant medication because it does work very, very well. Um, the, uh, but if, if you're... Uh, when you are starting with the stimulants, it's always important to start low and go slow, okay, uh, and, and titrate up.